Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. How is everybody? Hey, well, hi, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy around here. Honored to serve under Pastors Marcus and Natalie Avalos, who have been faithfully pastoring this church for about 15 years. And you know, if you plant seeds long enough and stick around, you eventually get to sit under the, the trees that you planted. Sometimes you just got to wait, wait. And we're, we're in a season right now of tremendous growth here at the church. If you didn't notice, we had to add a lot of chairs this week. We, it, we added more chairs because there's more of y'all. So we added a bunch of chairs this week. But, and you also may have noticed there's a new building out there. Uh, somebody donated us that building. It's going to be 3,000 square feet for administrative uh, purposes. We'll be able to blow out this wall over here and expand our kids' area. So a lot of cool stuff happening, but with growth comes a lot of other responsibilities. And we, we, we had something happen uh, over the last two weeks. And so we're just going to put this out there, leave it with you, and see if you want to be part of helping with it. Um, you probably notice we don't take an offering around here, and we don't usually ask for money. But last week, we had two things happen that we were not anticipating. One, uh, the AC went out, which you can always kind of anticipate an AC going out before the summer, right? That's going to be about $6,000 for the supplies to fix it. Uh, and it's for the kids. Do it for the children, okay? So uh, it's the kids' area that the AC went out. We've got the guys to fix it. We just need all of the supplies to fix it. So we've got guys in the church that are going to fix it. Um, and the second thing is that building out there is amazing. Somebody gave us that building. It's a several hundred thousand dollar building, but you have to put it together, and uh, that's going to cost about thirty to $40,000. So if you feel the need uh, or the desire to be part of that project, we're not going to be bringing it up on a regular basis, but we wanted to throw it out there. You can just give to the little red box in the back. So second thing, our worship pastor, Jeremiah Roby, the man, the myth, the legend right here, uh, he had a new song come out this week on all the platforms. I listen on Spotify. Uh, you can get it on iTunes. It's a song called, What, you, what, would, what would You Have Been Like? It's a song uh, about a, a challenging miscarriage they went through. And so if you've got somebody that's been going through something like that, struggling with that, it could be a really encouraging song for them. Uh, do we have that slide for that? We don't have the slide for it. But anyway, <laughs> just put in Jeremiah R-O-B-Y on Spotify or iTunes and all that. You can stream that music for free. So y'all ready for this? Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. All right. I'm super pumped because over the last two years, I have been working on a book called Connecting the Dots. Now, the book started out as a sermon series here at the church called The Circle Perspective. But over time, when you write a book, the publisher, they get to decide what the title is going to be. And they decided the better title was Connecting the Dots, What God is Doing When Life Doesn't Make Sense. And the book's coming out in two weeks. So we're going to be doing a series this whole month based on the book and the concepts in the book. So if you're like, man, I want to learn more about something you talked about today, it's in the book. You can pre-order the book. I'll put a, a little link up later. But uh, March 14th, it'll be out. But m m the basic premise for this book is this. And this is the basic premise for this whole series. Right now, God is at work in your life. But most of the time, you can't see his work or understand it. You just have to trust that he's working behind the scenes in the situation you're in right now, which means that financial struggle you're going through right now, he's working behind the scenes in that. That issue with your business right now, he's working behind the scenes in that. That struggle you're going through in your marriage, he's working behind the scenes. And, and Soren Kierkegaard said, life is lived forward, but it can only be understood looking backward. So what you have to do is you have to trust that right in the middle of the struggle, God is some way somehow working in there and, and and our basic concept is that i believe that god we're going to talk about this today god works in our life in a very specific pattern you may not always understand what he's doing but he's always working in a very specific pattern and he's always working to accomplish a purpose so let's get something out of the way right now what is god doing when life doesn't make sense here's what he's doing we know that in all things god works together for the good of those who love him to those who are called according to his purpose. So you go, well, God, what's going on? What's going on? What are you doing? Here's what he's doing. He's working all things together for your good and for his glory. You can be confident of that. And that's the perspective that I hope we can walk away from over the next few weeks as we talk about your specific struggles and challenges and what God's doing right in the middle of that. So y'all ready for that? 
All right. I was serving at a church a few years ago as a worship pastor, and um, I started to get into writing. I went, decided I wanted to start writing books. This was about 10 years ago. And I told the pastor I wanted to go to this writer's conference, and he was not very happy about that. It was a growing church. He's like, I can't have you gone on a Sunday, um, and I don't want you writing anyways. You're a worship pastor. And I was like, well, yeah, don't tell me what I am. You know, I'm going to go. So I went to this conference, and it, yeah, worst thing to tell Joel. Don't tell me what I am. And don't control me, right? So, so I, uh, I went to this writer's conference, and they got a guy to fill in for me while I was gone. Well, I got home, and I found out that they had, the pastor, without checking me, with me, had offered my job to the guy who had filled in for me. I was ticked, and he didn't, the pastor didn't even tell me. Another staff member told me. and said, hey, that guy that filled in for you, he offered your job to him. I'm like, what the? So I went to this guy. He's a good friend of mine. I had gotten him back into ministry after he'd made some dumb decisions. I was like, what are you doing? He's like, no, you're not fired. You're just not going to work there anymore. <laughs> I'm like, this sounds like fired. No, don't think of it as being fired. Just think of it as you not being the worship guy anymore. I'm like, well, what was this? Long story short, it was very devastating. I felt totally betrayed. I felt hurt by the church. I felt like I had just gotten completely burned. I remember that, that it threw us into this chaotic season because just three months earlier, that same pastor had said, hey, I want you to stick around, so I'm going to give you a pay raise so you can go buy a house. And we had bought a house. We had spent a month remodeling it, and we had been in the house a grand total of about a month when all this went down. And all of a sudden, I was jobless. It was a devastating, confusing, chaotic time. Uh, it was really hard because I didn't really want to go back to that church for obvious reasons. But every church I went to in town knew who I was. So I'd go to church and they're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, oh, I'd have to tell them the whole sob story of what happened to me. Very awkward, lonely feeling time. And I just remember just being so angry and hurt and bitter. Well, I got over it. But what's interesting is, you know, a few years ago, I, we felt like, Emily and I felt like God was calling us to start a retreat center for pastors out in Kerrville. So we built this retreat center out there for pastors and people in ministry who just need a break and need to get away and need to get some counseling. You know, I have a master's degree in counseling. And uh, the first person who called me once our doors were open was a pastor. He called me and said, hey, you're never going to believe what happened. I showed up at church on Sunday and the elder board met me in the parking lot and said, you don't work here anymore. Go your merry way. And he's like, what do I do? And I'm like, well, welcome to the club. <laughs> I've been there. And I look back at that experience. He came out to the retreat center. And we hung out. We had dinner with him, had a great talk with him. I said, look, man, now God, God's really ready to use you now. Because I'm, I'm convinced of something A.W. Tozer said. He said, it's doubtful whether God can use a person greatly before he has first wounded them deeply. I'm like, I don't like that. But the fact is God oftentimes allows a wound into our life before he can use us in great ways. And I think part of it is just to humble ourselves and make us realize that it's all him anyways that does it. But I thought about that. I was like, you know, if I had not had that horrible experience happen to me back there, I don't think I would have fully understood what that guy was going through later, 10 years later, helping this guy now. And I see God used that thing that happened in my past to prepare me for what he wanted to do with me in the future. And I believe with complete and total confidence that is the way God works. In your life, right now, whatever you're going through, if you can keep your heart pure and keep your perspective lifted, down the road, it's quite possible that the worst possible thing that happened to you could actually become something that God turns around and uses for something absolutely amazing in your future. And here's the really good news. Even stuff you messed up, even the mistakes you made, God is so powerful. He can even turn those things around into something that gives you a message and a purpose in the future. My, my mentor, David Nicholson, he says this way. He says, Joel, God already accounted for your stupidity in the plan, my friend. <laughs> I'm like, thank God for that. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that today because here's what, here's what I know about everybody in this room. Every one of you right now, if we were to talk for a few minutes, there's something going on in your life, and it's confusing you a little bit. You're probably asking this question right now. You're going, why? Why is this happening? Why did he leave? Why did she leave? 
Like, I thought this was going to be forever. I thought the marriage was going to last forever, but now we're signing the divorce papers. Why? Financial struggles. You're like, man, God, I've, been, I've even been faithful in my tithing, and we're struggling financially. Why? Why is this happening? Maybe you've been calling out to God looking for some sort of an answer from him, and he's not answering. going, God, why are you so silent? Why aren't you talking to me? Why aren't you giving me the answers? We all have these seasons we go through. We're like, why? What's happening? And as a counselor and as a pastor, I have learned something, and it's this. When you're going through a struggle, why is not the best question to ask? <laughs> because there may not be a real clear answer right now. Because remember, life is only lived, for, it's, it's lived forward, but it can only be understood looking backwards. I'm convinced of this. The better question to ask is, how am I going to respond? Why is for later? Why did this happen? Why is this happening? Is for later with the benefit of hindsight. How is for now? How am I going to respond in this situation to what's going on? You know, I've, I, I've, I've, I've often joked that when I get before God, I'm going to ask him a few questions about some things. <laughs> God, why did you, you... But, you know, if you read through the Bible... All indications are that anybody that has ever stood before the face of God, the first thing they do is drop to their knees, put their face on the ground, and go, true and just are your judgments. I had no idea what I was talking about. And I believe that, that there's certain things we're never going to get an answer for why it happened on this side of the space-time continuum. It'll only happen when we stand before eternity and stand in, in eternity before God, and we go, oh, oh, true and just are your judgments. But I do believe there are certain things in our life right now, that as we look back, we can begin to see that God really was working behind the scenes. And if you begin to recognize the pattern of his work, it can really give a sense of meaning and purpose to the struggles you're going through right now. Because if you really did believe God works all things together for the good of those who love him, what difference would it make in your perspective on your current situation? If you really believe that right now, I don't know what God's doing, but I really believe that in the end, somehow I'm going to go, oh, wow, true and just were your judgments. You did the right thing in this one. You knew what you were up to. God is always leading us. And there's, there's a verse, where we, we all know it really well, Psalm 23, right? It says, the Lord is my shepherd. He guides me in paths of righteousness. Now, that, that Hebrew word path is a very fascinating word. It's magol. And what it means is paths made of circles. And if you think about it, if you look at your life, there's a very good possibility that as you look back over your life, you find yourself circling back to certain themes over and over again. And go, we're doing this again? That again? <laughs> certain people maybe come back to your life and you're like, whoa, them again? Maybe certain time frames, every three, every five, every seven years, something changes in your life and you're like, oh, this again? What? What? I believe that God's, the way he leads us is in these circular paths of righteousness. I don't think it's a straight line. I think it's a circular path path going round these certain themes at the core of who you are is you right but he's pushing you out to become all you could be there's this verse that says the gifts and the callings of god are without repentance meaning that when god puts something in you there's certain things about you the way he made you the way your temperament is that he put those in you and he made them he made you the way you are for a purpose he just wants you to walk in the fullness of all he made you to be in this glorified uh, state of who, who, of who he made you to be, right? So we start here, but there's this consistent pattern I've seen in every season of life of how God works. Usually, a new season starts with a turning point. A turning point is anytime life changes. Sometimes turning points are things we expected, the birth of a child, you know, getting married, retirement. And sometimes... Turning point is uh, things you didn't expect, a divorce, death of a loved one, an illness. And when the turning point happens, this is, this is also the pattern of all the great movies and stories we love. Think, think about Luke Skywalker. He's minding his own business on Tatooine, and little droids show up with a hologram. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. And all of a sudden, he's like, who is this? He finds Obi-Wan Kenobi, and the next thing he knows, he's in an intergalactic battle for the universe. Finding the droid was a turning point. The next thing that's required, or think about the turning points with uh, Dorothy. You know, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. She's minding her own business, and a whirlwind comes and sweeps her up into Oz, and she has to find her way home. Then courage is required in every season. 
You have to make some choices. Are you going to step into the journey or are you going to resist? Then there's a guide who always shows up. A Gandalf shows up to show Frodo the way, right? Or uh, Trinity shows up to show, or, or Morpheus shows up to show uh, Neo in the Matrix. Thank you. Yeah. You must be a Matrix guy. Yeah. All of them. Okay, yeah. See, we love heroic stories. It's an example of that, right? And then a decision. They have to go all in. Then they face a series of challenges. They face a dark cave. So this is the sequence. And I believe that in every season of life, if you can come to understand this, which is what the whole book is about, each chapter is about one of these stages, you can begin to see how God's working and what to expect in each season. And every, you know, it's, it's not a perfect every time, like the lines aren't clearly divided, but it's a general pattern of God's work in our life, but it's always expanding out from who we are. And there's this verse where, where Paul's talking to the, the Corinthian church, and he says this. He says, if we're out of our mind, it's, as some say, it's for God. Like, have you ever notice that when you come to Christ, you start you feeling like God's calling you to do something, and people are like, who do you think you are? Like, are you out of your mind? Like, what are you doing? And you're like, I know it seems crazy, but I think God's telling me I'm supposed to do this. He says, if we're out of our mind, it's for God. But if we're in our right mind, it's for you. And he says, because Christ's love compels us. Now, this is a weird word because in some translations, the Greek word for this, it actually says constrains us. My mom, when she first read the text, she goes, uh, my Bible says constrains. And I was like, ooh, I've got a real problem here. Well, I started reach, looking up the word. And the word is this, suneko. And suneko means to be held by, to urge, impel or to press together with the hand. So what it's basically saying is Christ's love comes around us and then he squeezes us like a tube of toothpaste, pushing us out to become all we can be. That's how Paul describes God's love for us. He says, hey, I love you just the way you are, but there's way more in you than this. I'm going to squeeze you to become all you can be. And I'm telling you, I've talked to people as a counselor who are at the top of their game. CEOs, they've arrived. I mean, everybody looks at them. They got the car. They got the great family. Everything's perfect. But when I talk to them, they say, well, everything's good. I've got a great family, great life. I love everything about it. But I know there's more in me that I'm supposed to accomplish. I know there's more in me than this. But I've talked to also people who have hit rock bottom. And every time they hit the bottle again or shoot up or snort up or whatever, they say, man, I know I'm better than this. It's just the pain is so bad. And I'm convinced that the Bible says we need to be content in every circumstance. But I also believe there's this sense of holy discontentment that when God's love gets in you, you can't help but want to be more than you are right now. And he puts this holy discontentment in you. You say, man, I know there's more in me than this. And that is a good sign if you're feeling that because it means God's love is pushing you to become all you can be. And what's going to be required is to embrace the adventure. Because make no mistake... Whenever a turning point comes, it usually shows up in a form we would prefer. That it, it, It's not in the form we would prefer, better said. <laughs> yeah, I say it's not an adventure until something goes wrong. When the turning point comes, the adventure starts. But it usually starts with something we never would have asked for on our own. I mean, sometimes we think we asked for it. Like, oh, I want a kid. And then you get a kid and you're like, whoa, who was ever ready for having kids? Anybody? No, you just got to dive in and go for it. Who's ever ready for being married? You thought you were. It's going to be so great. We're just going to be making love all the time. And then you get married, you're like, oh, she talks back? Like, like whoa, what is this? Nobody's ever quite ready for it. So when life happens, you have a choice to make. Okay, you can see the adventure in one of two ways. The unknown of the future, when life changes, you have these choices to make. One is you can see yourself as a victim of your circumstances. You thought he was going to be faithful to the end, but he wasn't. Your husband cheated on you and you go, I wasn't supposed to be a single woman at this age, but here you are now. And yes, you were victimized by the situation. The problem with this is psychologically, when you see yourself as a victim, this is the danger of victimhood mindset. It's okay to acknowledge something wrong was wrong, done wrong to you. But the problem with victimhood mindset is it actually shifts your brain chemistry. And your brain goes into survival and protection mode. So you see everything as a threat. Protect, protect, protect. And you've seen this sometimes maybe with somebody who lost somebody they loved. 
they immediately go into protection and survival mode. And they, it's fear. In fact, grief and fear go hand in hand a lot of times because it just feels like they feel like the same emotion. <coughs> fear is a strong fear. And if you had, like if there's ever been an infidelity in your marriage or something like that, it's like the grief of it feels like fear and you don't know what you can trust anymore. And when you go into victimhood mindset, the problem is it shrinks your world. And you're just focused on anything that threatens you. So that's generally not the best place to hang out. But there's another option. You can see yourself as an adventurer. When you have this shift in mindset, what actually happens to the brain chemistry is your mind goes into learning mode. And your mind starts to open up and go, okay, what is there to learn in the middle of this? And you actually begin to be open to possibilities. And it happens just with a simple shift in mindset. But you've got to have the perspective to realize what's happening. Too often when life hits, we go, why? Why is this happening to me? As if the challenges of life are some unique burden that's been laid upon us. But know this, life is just hard. And whether you want the turning points or not, they're going to come. And you've got to make a decision, how am I going to respond? And my hope for all of us through this series, through the book, is that you would begin to see when the turning points hit and you want to start asking why, that's not the best question. The best question is, how am I going to respond right now to what's happening in my life? And I'm going to choose to embrace this adventure, and I'm going to believe the adventure God gave me is the one I needed. <coughs> you go, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't think I was going to be at this place in my life, in my 40s, my 50s. I thought I'd be much further along. I didn't sign up for this, but here we are. Here's the reality of the situation, and I'm going to embrace it, and I'm going to choose the path of courage because that's what an adventurer does. And if you, one of my favorite authors, actually my favorite author, period, is J.K. Chester, and he says this, an adventure is only an inconvenience rightly considered. An inconvenience is only an adventure wrongly considered. It just depends on your perspective on the challenges in front of you. How are you going to see it? You never thought you'd find yourself in your mid-30s addicted to this. And getting out of it's going to be hard. But you're going to choose to say, all right, Lord, I believe you're taking me on an adventure of freedom here. And I'm going to do whatever it takes in this hard adventure to get free from this. Lord, I've messed up my life. I make all these challenges, but I'm waking up now to realize I need to fix things. And I'm believing that you're going to, this adventure you're sending me on is something you're going to guide me on. And the first step that's required whenever the turning point happens is to choose courage. Now, courage is a tricky thing because most of us have a hard time acknowledging our fears. I, I, I talked to a guy a few years ago. He was getting out of the military, a very high-ranking military guy. And <clears throat> I said, what do you want to do next? I said, I don't know. He, he's like, I really don't know. And I've, in counseling, whenever somebody says, I don't know what I want to do next, that's usually a sign of fear to me. So if you're looking at your life right now and going, I don't know what to do next, it's probably fear. But most of us don't want to acknowledge our fear because who wants to admit they're afraid of something? So I said, well, what do you want to do? Finally, after talking to him for 20, 30 minutes, he said, well, I've been thinking about going back to school, but man, I haven't taken a test in 30 years. I was like, oh, so you're afraid of a test? No, I'm not afraid of nothing. People shot at me in Afghanistan. I'm not afraid of anything. I'm like, are you concerned? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm a little concerned. And I'll be a little, I'll be the oldest guy in the class. I'm like, well, are you afraid of that? Does that cause you anxiety? No, I don't, I'm not afraid of nothing, man. I'm like, okay, are you concerned that you'll be the oldest guy? Yeah, I'm a little concerned. Call it whatever you want, y'all. Worry, concern, fear, trepidation, whatever. We've all got fear. I mean, f fear was this primal emotion we first felt when sin entered, right? Fear comes. And you have to acknowledge the fear because if you don't acknowledge the fear, it's going to come out in weird ways. And you'll start doing all sorts of compensatory like, things to compensate for your fear. That's where alcoholism, addiction comes in. A lot of times it's, it's trying to numb the fear. Why do, that's why they call it liquid courage, right? You're trying to numb your fear with all sorts of substances or sorts of responses, addictive responses. If you don't acknowledge the fear, it's not going to go away. It has to be faced. And this is the thing about fear. Fear does not go away until it is faced in small doses. Like an inoculation you get of, give your little child that live virus they give you. Like, you're, in, you're injecting my kid with a live virus? Yeah. It's so that their body can build immunity to it and strength to it. And the only way you're going to beat the things you fear is by facing them in small doses. I had a lady right before church. 
She had surgery two weeks ago for something that they thought was going to be cancerous, and thank God it wasn't. I believe God healed her. Um, and she said, my greatest fear was always to have surgery. And I found out I was going to have surgery. She said, and I, I went to God, and I was like, God, I'm so afraid. And he said, you know, the only way you're going to beat this is to go through it. And she said, man, I'll never forget when they rolled me in on that operating table, and it's happening. This peace came over me as I faced the thing I feared. And she's like, I'm not afraid anymore of this stuff. The only way fear goes away is when you acknowledge it and face the thing you fear in small doses. But the first thing you have to do is recognize the fear. And a lot of people, that, that here's some of the key fears that I've seen that hold us back. First one is failure. So many people I talk to, they feel like God's calling them to do something. Like, but what if I fail? What if I fail at it? And this is how I encourage them. I say, you probably will. So now go do it. I can't tell you how many things in my life I have failed at. People look at all my successes, and they're like, look at all those successes. And I'm like, yeah, but that's because I don't put failures on a resume. Do you ever put failures on a resume? Dude, I really botched this one. <laughs> look, at, and look, at, I screwed this one up. And man, I drained the bank account on this one. <laughs> you don't put failures on your resume. You only put successes. But failures are just as important as success. In fact, I think failures are more important than success. There's a guy that did a study. I talk about it in the book. Galenson is his name. He did a study of the artists that their, their work got the greatest acclaim. Uh, guys like da, da Vinci and Rembrandt. And they found that as you do, do um, scans of their work, you find that the final work that we see as the masterpiece was actually built upon layer and layer and layer and layer and layer of them tweaking the artwork. So if you think about it, the, the final work was built on a series of imperfect failures of the work. But they didn't see it as failures. They just saw it as developing it to its fullest potential. And in your life, so many times the stuff you look at as failures, it's just another layer that you just need to go, oh, we just got to tweak that a little bit. Mona Lisa's smile's not quite perfect yet. <laughs> and if you begin to see failures, it's not a failure unless you give up. It's just learning what didn't work. Was it I, uh, was, uh, the light bulb guy? What was his name? Edison. Edison. Yeah. And I said, you know, he's like, I didn't, I didn't fail a thousand times. He just found it. He's like, I found a thousand ways it didn't work, right? <laughs> Failure is one that holds people back. And I'm going to be honest. All of these that I'm talking about here, they really come down to one thing, and it's your pride. Because the next one's this, being unqualified or disqualified. When I first started leading outdoor adventures, I get emails from people all the time, and they'd be like, who are you certified to lead these outdoor adventures through? <laughs> I don't know. I just started people, leading people on outdoor adventures. <laughs> and they'd write back, and they like, well, I'm certified. And they'd literally put this laundry list of people that are certified through. I'm like, that's amazing. I'm like, well, how many people are you taking on outdoor adventures? And they're like, well, none. I'm like, man, I got people lined up to go with me. <laughs> and what I'd find is these people were actually asking me for a job. First guy through the wall is always the bloodiest. But once the wall is broken down, people go, oh, you can go that way? Yeah. But I was just stupid enough to go for it. And a lot of times you think you need more qualifications, more certifications. Reinhard Bonnke, he said this. I love this quote. He said, those who forever seek the will of God are overrun by those who do it. God telling you to do something is all you need to move forward. Now, you might want to go get some education, but don't sit around waiting for the education to move out in obedience on what God's asking you to do. Learn as you go. And so many things in my life, this has worked out quite well for me because I've done so many things in my life I'm completely unqualified to do. I had a guy write me the other day. He's like, would you read, would you read over this book of mine and check the theology on it? This is a, a pastor that has a PhD in theology. I go, I'm the wrong guy to be checking theology. He's like, He's like, actually, you probably have the best theological framework I, of anyone I know. I'm like, dude, I have a, I have a bachelor's degree in politics. <clears throat> He's like, yeah, but you've learned theology along the way. I never got a PhD in theology, but here I am, people looking to me for theological advice. I'm like, I don't even feel qualified for that. You just got to do it, and you get qualified as you go, because God doesn't, you've heard this before, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Some of you feel like you've disqualified yourself, and God's calling you to do something, but you, you're so proud that you think you're disqualified, and God's like, you're not disqualified until I say you're disqualified, and you're not, so move forward in that. Another, another one, 
hold people back is the right timing. Well, once I've got more money in the bank, and let, you know, once the kids are out of college, a lot of times God will call you to do something that seems to be the worst possible time. And if he's calling you to do it, seek counsel, seek advice, but step out because it might be the worst possible time. But if he's calling you to do it, it's the perfect time. And the final thing is this, fear of looking foolish. <clears throat> this has worked out very well in my life. I have gotten over the fear of looking foolish, and I'll just dive into stuff that I have no clue to do. And the other day, I was building a deck, and I'm thinking, I'm doing this wrong. I know I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> and my friend Bill Wilcox shows up. He's like, bro, you're doing that wrong. <laughs> and then he does it for me. And I can't tell you how many times in my life I'm like, you know what? I don't quite know what I'm doing, but I'm okay with looking foolish. And I go and I start doing it, and then God sends people to bail me out. But the, but the job gets done. This whole retreat center I've been working on in Kerrville, what a stupid project I was thinking that I could do it on my own. It was stupid of me to think I could do it on my own. But I was just willing enough to look foolish doing it. I, I can't tell you how many contractors came out and they're like, you ever done anything like this before? I'm like, never done anything like before. They're like, like this, who is this moron, right? <laughs> I can't tell you how many things God has accomplished in my life because I just got over myself. And I was like, all right. I'm going to look like a fool doing this, and I'm going to be honest that I have no clue what I'm doing. But then somehow right in the middle of that, God works his purpose in my life. So my question for you is this. What is it today that's happening in your life that requires courage? What's the fear you've been afraid? Maybe you've been afraid to come clean on the, the addiction. Like, man, if I go check myself into rehab... People are going to know. But the fear is, is, is holding you back from becoming all God wants you to be. Maybe God's calling you to step out and get involved in ministry or start a business or do some sort of art or something like that. What is it that God's calling you to do? And I would encourage you, acknowledge the fear, but recognize it ain't going away. It's just going to forever haunt you until you step out and embrace the adventure that God has ahead. And there's a very good chance you're going to look foolish doing it. There's a very good chance you're going to be unqualified. You think you're unqualified, but really, if you look back on your history, God's actually prepared you for it. But you probably won't realize that until you're deep in the throes of it. What is it that requires courage today? I want to, I want to say this, man. Get on your knees, humble yourself, and ask God for the courage to move forward. Because the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you, and he will give life and strength to you right in the middle of your fear. What's the turning point that's happened? What's the courage? Next week, we're going to talk about the guide and how to hear the voice of God, how to know that God is actually speaking to you. But for today, I want, I want to just close with this. Never doubt that God really is working all things together for your good right now in the middle of this. So be courageous. What would you do today in your situation if you weren't afraid? What would you do? How would you respond right now if you weren't afraid? And the reason you're, you wouldn't be afraid is, is not because you can drum up some sort of courage that isn't there. It's because you have confidence that in all things, God really does work together for the good of those who love him and those who are called according to his purposes. And right now, that thing you're looking at is staring down the face of this gun that looks like the worst possible thing that could happen to you. What if this is all preparation for your greatest days ahead? I believe it is. That's what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you really are working in behind the scenes always. You're always doing 10,000 things in our life. And man, we're lucky if we get to see three. But faith is confidence that you are working even when we can't see it. So I pray for those this morning, man, they've got some relational struggles or financial struggles or their own emotional torment they're going through, guilt. And Lord, I pray this morning, Lord, that you would just come in and fill them with the courage to face those things that they've been trying to ignore. And I just believe that you're going to take us to a new level over the next few weeks as we talk and look at, look at your faithfulness in our life that gives us the courage to move forward. If you're here this morning and you have not given your life to Jesus, I'm going to give you a chance to do that. I'm going to say a prayer in a second. If you say this and mean it with your heart, God's going to come and transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, set you up an eternal address in eternity with him. Let's uh, say this prayer together. Lord Jesus. We repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Man. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We've got some resources in the back to help you on your journey. If you guys want to do me a huge favor, pre-order this book right here. 
there's a link to it, um, and you, it'll be on your doorstep March 14th. We'll be continuing the series. Also, there's a version devotional on the version Bible app. It just went live this week with this, uh, with this series on it. So you can go to the version Bible app, put in my name, or put in Connecting the Dots. It'll come up. We actually got a lot of downloads of it the first day. So that's where you can pre-order the book. And um, you guys are dismissed. Have a great week. Be blessed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.